היי יואב, מה נשמע? בסדר שוהם, מה שאתה רוצה לדבר על He is a leading AI expert, artificial intelligence experts that received several global awards in the field. He's also a serial entrepreneur and founded several AI companies. And I'll leave some other parts of the bio if it's okay uh, for later on. Um, so let's, uh, let's, uh, let's jump into the subject. So you are one of the pioneers to develop and host a MOOC, massive open online courses. offering basically higher education to the masses. That was a big premise. And, um, and this notion of MOOC, which was a big vision, also was criticized. Um, but at the end of the day, you, if I correct me if I'm wrong, I believe that you had an online uh, game theory course had close to a million students. So from your perspective, um, do you feel like um, MOOCs really fulfilled the original vision? What have we learned? So, um, uh, so yeah, first of all, thanks again for having me. Um, so I do think that MOOCs are not flash in the pan. This, there have been uh, technolog technologies in the past that sort of threatened to uh, disrupt education, uh, you know, radio and uh, what have you. Um, uh, I don't, I think this is different. Uh, and, uh, but the, and, and certainly you, you see, significant impact. Uh, when I taught my first course, we uh, had uh, students from, I want to say 120 countries, and uh, it, it's really transformative. Um, I, by now, uh, uh, as you mentioned, a lot of people kind of registered to the courses, uh, I believe over a million now. I think only, you know, quote unquote, 50,000 graduated. Um, It's still more people than I ever saw at Stanford uh, in my uh, with my own eyes. So uh, it's certainly transformative. Have they reached their potential? Absolutely not. I think that if you look, and I'll just speak from my own course, uh, it's a disaster. Um, it, it's very popular. It's one of the more popular ones, uh, but it's, uh, it, I wouldn't do it the same way again. It's really like every medium you... Take the old medium and we, when people move from television to, from radio to television uh, it looks like televised radio and that's how my course looks like uh, online it doesn't use the medium for what it's really uniquely good at and that's a process that will take and the time we live in maybe will accelerate the process so one of the key issues with MOOCs but in general in distance learning is the social distance or the physical distance between the between the students so you And, and we get this question a lot, the, the concern of both teachers and parents about the physical distancing and the fact that school, university is not only about learning, it's also about social interaction. Learning and social interaction within learning is a very important and key part. So how do you see, do you see it as a key part and how do, how do we solve this challenge? So a uh, very good point. Um, one first of all really has to differentiate between Uh, so for example, online, I, have, I have three young kids who went uh, through online education now during the pandemic. And that's a very different experience than what a post uh, high school, you know, whether it's a student or a lifelong learner process they go through. Um, obviously, in the case of young kids, the social interaction is not only a key component, maybe it's the key component. But uh, let's focus maybe on post kind of uh, Uh, you know uh, high school education uh, the social component is very important for a number of reasons uh, first of all even if you look only at learning outcomes uh, social interaction is very important it can be facilitated to a large extent uh, with technology it is being facilitated to a large degree with technology but uh, when you think about the role of and let's be specific about in the modern university um, Social interaction uh, is important for other reasons as well. It forms lifelong bond, whether professional or personal. 
its ex uh, relationship with researchers in some universities, so exposure to research. Um, and uh, not all of that can be recreated, which means that uh, one has to rethink this aggregated value proposition that kind of consolidated around the modern university, initially in sort of Germany and, and England, and now U.S. kind of leading the uh, leading the charge there. And I think a number of people are thinking that there's a growing mismatch between the needs of more, uh, modern technology and the and the structure of the modern university. You know, many speak about AI today, um, AI for the audience, artificial intelligence is the future basically of everything, right? And in terms of, the, of education, do you believe that AI will really make a dramatic change in education for years to come? And what are the key elements that we really will see a disruption with in the way that we learn? Will it be really that personalized, really that adaptive? Does it really make us better students, best, better learners? Right. So, um, so I have a horse in this race, uh, not, not in AI uh, for education, but in AI in general, and I'm very bullish on AI. I think there's often over promises, both in terms of what AI can deliver on and also on how key it is for the problem it's being, that's being addressed. Um, I think there's a, many places where algorithms, not all algorithms are AI, but algorithms can be used, uh, for personalization, for matching students, uh, for for an, uh, a bunch of you know personalized kind of personalized learning pathways. Honestly, the alg algorithms required there are uh, you know embarrassingly simple. So yeah, I think there's a role, role for algorithms, but a the cutting edge AI, you know, it can impact everything. This too, I don't think it's the game changer here. And more social engineering and institutional re-engineering would have much more impact on the technology. So talking about social engineering, uh, you know, many times for, for years, we we're hoping that technology will really shrink the gap in, in, in society. We look at COVID-19, in some ways it shrank, in some way it expanded the, the gap. Do you believe that technology really shrinks or expands the gap within society? And, with that aspect also, if you can talk a little bit about WeCode and why you part of it and why you invest your time as one of the founders there. Yeah, so this, this is key and this is the passion that I have. Um, look, I don't think technology in and of itself either widens or, uh, or narrows the gap. I think it's how it's deployed and what you wrap around the technology. Uh, it is the case that if you take a fire and forget MOOC-like experience, say on Coursera, which is a wonderful platform, and that's where my course runs, it certainly is biased towards self-motivated, usually people who have a very solid basis, who want to expand their horizon, want to retrain, want to uh, just expand, uh, you know, their skill set. Um, and in that respect, if that's all you do, it has a danger of expanding gaps. Not exactly right because there are people who are not uh, socioeconomically uh, di uh, diverse, but geographically diverse, and sometimes those people um, just don't have access to that level of education, and but do have the kind of personal, family, financial background to avail themselves. They are self-motivated. So in that respect, you know that the flat world that uh, the technology can't help kind of make a little smaller. But when you think about uh, sort of socioeconomic uh, gaps, there is a danger of, uh, you know, the have having more and the not have having not more. Um, the, uh, you even saw it in early experiments in MOOCs in California <clears throat> where students really needed hand-holding so they don't drop out or um, uh, you make the best use of the platform. Um, that really motivated the project we started in Israel, uh, which you alluded to called WeCode. It's um, a very innovative model where it's a hybrid academic vocational kind of model where um, maybe a step back for just a second, uh, the, you know, the old model of, you know, you study for, you know, it was 12 years or 16 or more, and then you go and work for IBM and 30 years later, you get your gold watch and uh, retire in your, uh, in your RV. Uh, those days are gone. 
uh, people change jobs. Uh, you know, I've seen various statistics. One of them is eight times during their career. Uh, we know that in technology, and technology is becoming more and more a key component of the job kind of skills needed. Technology changes very rapidly. And so you really need to uh, retrain. And so lifelong long learning is not a phrase, it's reality. Um, and uh, on the other hand, uh, there's an opportunity because to engage in with technology, you don't necessarily need a four-year college uh, 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 process. Now, uh, I do think that colleges play a very important role in a number of ways. We don't get, we don't have time to go into it, but for certain segments of society, a briefer introduction to the academic and intellectual part, coupled with a vocational component, can allow them to. Uh, engage in this uh, work environment to not have a glass ceiling because they've gotten a very narrow skill set that doesn't transfer, doesn't expand, uh, and yet allows them very quickly on the order of a year to start work, in our case, as programmers. And by all means, the academic part they have will carry credit if and when they want to continue uh, with the degree. What was key for us, though, was to uh, couple this program with a very strong um, uh, support network. Um, the, uh, the, the people coming into the, into the program come from very, very difficult background. They bring tears to your eyes when you hear about those. And it shows in the classroom, the people who don't know how to learn missing very key components. And so what you need to do, especially early on, uh, is really give them all those skills, 21st century skills, whether it's time management or self-confidence role models, and it's transformative. You see that uh, at the end of the uh, first month, they've transformed into um, really a killer group who can who performs as well as students who do come from more standard backgrounds. Um, and indeed, um, uh, we've been able to place them in programming positions uh, within nine months. Uh, but it really calls for coupling the traditional kind of teaching. Uh, by the way, there we haven't used so far uh, distance learning. As we expand, we definitely will. But uh, in whether it's distance or face-to-face, -face, you absolutely need to couple it with hand-holding. And by the way, this is where Israel has a huge, a huge advantage. Uh, it's not only because it has the great educational, you know, educational institutions and great technology, it's because it has those and it's small. And that allows us to really reach every corner in a very personal way. So, you know, this, this latest crisis really accelerated the use of this distance learning, online learning, technologies. Um, many things that we've, done, we've been trying to do for many years happen overnight, right? Because we were forced to do it. Do you see it as a blimp, as a temporary change, or a really paradigm shift, something that will stay for, uh, with us for years to come? Will it have a real impact on education in the 21st century, or this is just a bump in the road? Um, so first of all, I don't know. Um, people predict that the COVID impact in various areas will be lasting, for example, that uh, the move for work from home will, uh, will be sustained, uh, and so on. Uh, I don't know. Uh, I think the chances are that that if, if I had to bet, I would bet that, yes, it will accelerate change. And the reason is there is something very inefficient in the education and training mm -hmm. apparatus that we as a society developed and the way the world is in the 21st century. And when you have inefficiency, it's, yeah, there's a lot of inertia and sometimes you're stuck in there for a while. But then you have some discontinuity, like, for example, perhaps the COVID, that nudges you to a different point of the space. And once you see that, uh, there's sort of no going back. Now, I don't think it will be that simple. I think that uh, we won't get to the full, uh, we won't realize the full potential of distance education that quickly. I've seen, um, certainly in the elementary school, lots of obstacles to overcome. Uh, but even, you know, Technion moved within you know, three weeks to online education, there's a lot of work to be done to make it effective. But yeah, if I had to guess, I think probably we'll see durable impacts of this period. So in 30 seconds, what is the one thing that you believe that will change in the upcoming years in education? What will be the one element that will make a difference? 
Um, so I'll tell you what I hope will be the difference. Uh, I hope that, um, and I'm a product of the traditional kind of degree scheme, you know, from the bachelor's to the PhD. I don't think they'll go away, but I hope we see those complemented with new certificates of relevance to the various professions that will be as highly regarded and highly coveted and meaningful. And I think that will be in better harmony with the world needs. And that's my hope. And I think there's a chance it'll happen. That's certainly what we at WeCode are trying to help uh, achieve. Thank you so much, Yoav. It's great, great to see you. And thank you for uh, being here with us. And thank you and congratulations for the great first name. <laughs> for you, for the same, same for you for the family name. <laughs> okay, bye. Thank you for having me. Thank you.